Good morning. Welcome to The Rock. If you guys want to stand up, we're going to open up with worship to our awesome Father. Because it is a beautiful day. Every day you wake up alive, breathing. Every day you wake up, God, just fill us today.
This is a perfect song for a perfect time to raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. Today, we don't know what to believe, what we hear, what we see on TV, whether it's COVID or rioting or numbers. But in the middle of all of this, whether you like the president, whether you don't, you know what we need to do? We need to raise a hallelujah with our voices. We need to pray. We need to worship because not only does that break our spirit of fear that we hold, but it sings praises in heavenly places. It moves mountains. It moves things that we can't see. We don't fight against flesh. We don't fight against blood. We fight against things that we can't see. So when we're looking and seeing nothing, we need to raise a hallelujah in this moment. Is anyone else with me? You guys ready to sing? We're gonna raise a hallelujah with our spirits today. We're gonna raise a hallelujah with our hearts and with our voices. And you know what? It doesn't matter what you sound like. It doesn't matter the person standing next to you. Every sound that you make, every worship note that you sing, it is moving things in your lives. It is moving things in your families. It's moving things in the world. So we're gonna sing it out today, okay?
how about that? I'll just use this microphone instead. So, good morning, everyone. Welcome to The Rock. Oh my goodness, there's a creepy man again coming up here. Who are you, and what are you doing here? Well, I'm Idaho Joe, and I've come to wrestle all your children in this church, get rid of them for a little bit. Anyway, today we're going to talk about my cousin who actually happens to be a tomato. So if you want to find out about my cousin Tina the tomato, you're going to have to watch me after church today. But if you're a kid from three years old up to eighth grade, come on with me. We're going to go back to kids' church. All right. Thank you, Idaho Joe. And look out for that crazy tomato. I hope you all don't come back red like tomato juice. Go ahead. <laughs> hey, so I am, well, I'll move over here now. Hold on. They're going, they're going, they're on their way. <laughs> My name is Bethany. I'm the outreach pastor here at the Rock Church. And how many of you know our mission here at the Rock is helping families changing, changing lives. lives through the awesome, amazing love of God. And how many of you were here on Friday night for the fireworks explosion? Woo! Woo! It was amazing. We had a great turnout. The parking lot was full. We had to close the registration because we ran out of parking places. So it was amazing. I would love to see those pictures, wouldn't you? Yes. Okay, so hopefully the pictures are going to come up. <laughs> if not, oh, look at that. So we gave away bicycles. If you were here, we had 10 bicycles that we gave away. That was really fun. And there were, uh, we had the bounce houses set up. We had hamburgers and hot dogs, snow cones, popcorn. It was so cool. Uh, and then we did the foam party, which is, there's a picture coming up later. You'll see them all. They'll, there they come. They're coming now. There's the pictures. So we had a blast. The kids uh, loved the foam party, which that was our first time ever using our foam cannon. So it was a great success. And people were laughing and they're like, well, so much for social distancing. And I was like, it's okay, they're covered in soap. Like they're literally head to toe covered in soap. <laughs> it was pretty funny. And the grand finale, of course, was the fireworks, which were completely amazing. It was like a full half hour of really cool fireworks. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. It was such a great night, and we really touched our community. So many people just came up to me and Pastor Terry and the volunteers and just said, thank you, thank you. This was so wonderful. So we're looking forward to our next event, whatever that might be, because we're just going to keep on doing more things to reach our community. I appreciate everything that you guys do. And before we head into our next song, this is your opportunity to give. We have our cool little buckets up here, or if you want to give online, I would love that. You can go to our website, yourrock.org, and you can click on that little blue circle that says give. It's really simple. just takes a minute. You can set up recurring giving, which is very helpful to us because then we know what's coming in. Um, also, if you're visiting today, I would love to know that. If you go to that little box that says I'm new and just put your information in there, then I can send you a text and just find out um, more about you, be able to greet you, answer any questions. So if you would, even if you're watching online, you can do that. And it's a great way to be able to connect with people at the Rock Church and find out what's going on here. So we got one more song. Yes, let's do it. Saturday was silent, surely it was through. Since when has impossible ever stopped you? Friday's disappointment and Sunday's empty tomb. Since when has impossible ever stopped you? 
This is the sound of the dry bones rattling. This is the praise, make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of the dry bones rattling. Pentecostal fire stirring something new you're not gonna run out of miracles anytime soon resurrection power runs in my base too I believe there's a miracle here in this room this is the sound of the dry bones rattling this is the praise make a damn man walk again Open the grave, I'm coming out, I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of the dry bones I My God is able to save and deliver and heal and restore anything that he wants to. Just as the man who was thrown on the bones of Elijah, if there's anything that he can't do. Just as the stone that was rolled at the tomb in the garden, what happens when God says move? I feel it. The dry bones rattling. This is the praise, make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of the dry bones rattling. Are you guys ready for your dry bones to be rattling this morning? I know I am. I hear the sound. I hear the sound. I hear the sound. I hear the sound. Oh! 
up in the grave, I'm coming out, I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of the dry bone rattling. This is the sound of the dry bone everything. I'm doing switcher cameras. I'm doing all kind of stuff. Actually, my wife's running switcher, but I set it all up. So that's why I was all over the place this morning. I lost my clicker somewhere in this procedure, so I can't even advance my PowerPoints. Wait, we found it. See, you had it all that time. Jeez. Garrett took my switcher. Thank you, Garrett. That's so cool. Hey, we're really glad you're here this morning. I'm trying to get my mind back in focus because I'm sitting there trying. That's why Shannon's like, Pastor Terry, please turn on my guitar. So yeah, all that kind of good stuff because we have people on vacation, which is okay. But if you'd like to help with technology, we need it. We got Bethany's running the switcher today and we need Scott's normally running the switcher app. We need other people to learn how to do it. It's kind of cool. Sound, you can learn how to do sound as long as you have an ear for music. It's not a big deal. A um, little bit complicated, but not terribly bad. But anyhow, we're so glad you're here this morning. We're so glad you're here this morning. We're glad everyone's here. I don't know about you. I had a lot of fun at the fireworks explosion. Yeah, it was pretty cool. I thank God for it. We only had one person drive by and hope that we all got coronavirus and yell out the window that we would have coronavirus. But, you know, it's all good. God's good. How many know you just got to live life? You know, it comes a point in time where you just got to start living and saying, we're going to live this life and what happens, God's in control. And that's kind of where I'm getting to. Um, we do ask that you put a bracelet on if you didn't get a bracelet. And if you don't want to take it home, put it back in the barrel and we'll sanitize them all. Because, you know, some people took them and they're like, oh, I forgot them. So just put them back and we'll make sure they're cleaned and sanitized. We'll dump them in bleach water and all that kind of good stuff so that all the diseases and stuff like that are killed. That way you don't have to keep thinking about it, just in case you can't do that. But if you want to keep yours as your very own, that's cool too. All right? So anyhow, getting on with this thing. That's what they are, just to let you know. Red means I am social distancing. Just leave me alone. Yellow means talk to me. But don't shake my hand, don't hug me, don't do anything. Actually, we're not shaking hands, we're fist bumping, uh, all that kind of stuff. And green means I'm just living life, breathe on me, whatever you want. No, not really. <laughs> don't kiss them or anything like that. It's just, you know, you're green. Praise God. So also, I want to remind you that this week we're going to be back to pick a pastor's brain. That we'll be able to do that. I look so cool today. You know, I realized I put my flip-flops on. I'm like, I got socks in my flip-flops. It's really cool. Everyone wants to see. That's what happens when you get a suntan line when you ride bicycles all the time and you have shorts on with socks on all the time when you're riding a bike, but it's all cool. God's still so good. Also, I want to remind you we're going to do something new. How many like sand volleyball? Praise God. Well, we're going to be playing sand volleyball starting Thursday nights at 6.30. We're going to be doing sand volleyball, and we're going to be doing that. It's hot, I know, but you'll feel like you're at the beach. You know, bring some water, all that kind of good stuff. If you dive in the sand, it'll stick to you. It goes down your shorts, all that kind of great stuff. It's just awesome playing sand volleyball. But if you have a friend who would like to play sand volleyball, we're doing that. We've got it tilled back here. We're going to be buying a tiller so that we can till the courts more. Man, you just saw me. I was trying to till them for Friday, you know, and they haven't been tilled in like two years, and the one's still hard. If someone has a tractor with a plow on it, I could really use a plow because I can't get it to till, just let you know that. Um, but I got the one tilled, and I'm like hitting these dead spots. I'm like you know, holding on with all my might so it wouldn't take off. And I woke up yesterday morning, I'm like, Bethany, I am sore. And this morning I am sore because, you know, when you wrestle a tiller the whole time, they're supposed to be nice and smooth and, you know, just kind of grind up. Well, when it's like rock hard sand from being kind of dry and all that kind of stuff, it was no means like that. But we got it ready. We got the net up. I thank God that someone helped me put the net up. I don't remember your name, but thank you because you were the one who did it. I'm terrible at names. George. George over here did it. That's the guy who did it right there. Yep. Raise your hand, George, so they know who George is. There you go. That's George, in case you're wondering. Or Tom, whatever you want to be called. We'll call you whatever. I'll, it'll change next week. I'll give you a new name, okay? Because it'll just be good. But he helped me put the net up. We got the net up, and people were playing sand volleyball. Sand volleyball is kind of fun. All right? So anyhow, I want to get into the Word of God this morning. I just want to pray with you and ask God's blessing upon our hearts and upon our lives. And, you know, we've been talking about promised lands 
And I believe with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind that everyone in here, you've got a promised land. And I also want to tell you, starting in August, we're going to be going to two services so that we can social distance everybody because last week it was kind of crowded in here. And I'm really trying to keep social distancing so you can, you know, sing and not be all over everybody. Just to let you know that we're trying really hard to do that. Really, we are. Um, if you're comfortable with a mask, we ask that you wear a mask. If you don't wear a mask, according to HIPAA laws, I'm not allowed to ask you why you don't have a mask on. So, you know, it's, it's your life. It's all we can say about that. I can't wear a mask and preach. It's just not going to be like, <laughs> so we can't do that. So God's so cool and God's so good. But we've been talking about the promised land. And, you know, God wants to do a new thing in your life. And I believe that with all my heart, that we're in a season that's different. It's almost like God is allowed. Now, God didn't send coronavirus, just to let all you know that. All right? The thief comes not but to kill, steal, and destroy. But God has come that you might have life and life more abundantly. It annoys me when I read my insurance policy for the church or insurance policy for anything that says acts of God are not covered. And I'm like, well, which God are you talking about? It should be acts of little g God because that's evil, right? The thief comes to steal, kill, and steal. God said, I am the father of lights. Every good and perfect gift comes down from me. And you know what? As Christians, we need to do that. It's amazing. Something bad happens to someone, and they walk up to me and go, why did God let something bad happen to me? And I'm like, well, what about all the good times that you forgot about that God did do in your life? And God sometimes allows things to happen in our lives, but he is not the cause of evil, just to let you know that. God is not evil. God is good. But sometimes he'll allow things to happen to get your attention in your life. How many know that? I've gotten too close to things, and God kind of allowed them to move out of my way. And at first, I was like, God, why are you doing this to me? Anyone raised as a kid, you had mom and dad do that, right? If you had a real mom and dad, they like take things off you and say, you're not listening. I'm thinking, but you're like, come on, but I was mine. No, I'm not giving it back to you. When do I get it back? I'm not telling you. That's what God kind of does. He allows things to be taken out of our lives. And I feel like in this time in America that, you know what, we're in a crossroads where we've got to decide what we're going to do with our lives. And I mean all of us. And it starts with us as individuals. You know, there's so much division and so much strife and so many things like that. And I believe with all my heart, it's the time when the church needs to arise like never before. That all of us need to find that promised land. What has God really called me for? You know, I was sitting there thinking about something. And I was thinking about life. And uh, there's a fireworks explosion on Friday, and I met some people that I haven't seen in church for probably six, seven, eight years, and I took them through the church, and I would show them around the church, and, and I'm, you'll never know this person, so it's all good. I'll keep it very vague, but I remember this person, whenever they were here, they walked up to me, and they said, I really feel called of God that I'm called to be a youth pastor, and when I saw this individual, and I was talking to the group of them that they were all with, and I was thinking about this person's life. And I looked at this individual and I thought, wow, where you are today now by making your own decisions compared to where you went whenever you followed God's desires and God's ways. How many know what I'm talking about? And I looked at this individual's life and I thought, how different would your life be? And I want to say that seriously. In this person's life, it's not where it should be. And I sat there and I thought about As I stood there and I was looking at this person and engaging with this person and talking with their family and stuff like that and their friends and all that kind of stuff, I thought, how many lives would have been touched positively if you would have stepped into that position and you would have did what God was laying upon your heart to do? One of the things I want to talk about as I go through this next few series is how does God talk to us? I don't know, I used to read the Bible, you know, like, and tonight I'm going to preach on Joshua, and it's like, and God said to Joshua, so did God sit there and go like, hey Marvin, yo, what's happening down there? I just want to tell you what to do, you listening? You know, God doesn't do that. I honestly, in my life, I've walked with God for a significant portion of my life, or at least tried to. I really believe one time in my entire life did I ever really feel like I heard God literally speaking, where God literally spoke something into my life that was in a really difficult time, and it was a really hard time in my life, and a really questioning time in my life, and I was actually praying right here, and we had a sound room up there, and literally it sounded like God was standing in the sound room, and God literally spoke to my heart because of my ears it reverberated through this place and what he said and I could quote it to you but it's not significant to you so you don't need to know what he said but he spoke to me and it's the only time that I ever can really 
think maybe, Ross, that he talked to me. All the other times, God talks to me by impressing things in my mind. And that's how God talks to all of us. You see, this person had a dream, and they walked up to me, and they said, I feel like God's calling me to be a youth pastor. And I was like, that's awesome. I think you'd be great at it. And, and they had the qualities for it, and they had the personality for it, and they had all that kind of stuff. But they decided to go a different way. And their life is pretty messed up right now. And, and literally, I thought about how many young people would now be following Jesus Christ because how many know we change a world by relationship? You see, that's why we did a fireworks explosion. And some people might say, why did we do that? Because of relationship. I cannot tell you the number of people that I engaged with on Friday night that walked up to me. Matter of fact, I don't even know who the individual was, but this one girl about this tall walked up to me and said, I'm not coming to church this Sunday, but I'm coming to church next Sunday. I'm like, well, that's really cool. And I talked to other families, and they're like, can we come to church here? And I was like, no. You can't come to our church. No. That's honestly how I answer most people when they say that, and then I laugh. And I say, of course you can come to church here. You know, some people honestly think you have to make an appointment to go see church. You know, like, are we allowed here? Members only club. We're here for everybody. We're the rejects. We're the broken misfit toys from that misfit island from the Santa Claus movie where most all of us have issues or have been through storms, messed up. How many in here messed up your life? Yeah, you got it messed up. Yeah, you're good. You're right where you're supposed to be. Praise God. We've been there, and that's the grace and the mercy of a miracle-working God. And people are changed by that relationship. So I told you the story about this individual who's a youth pastor, and I sit there and I wonder, what has God laid on your heart to become? I've had people that walk up to me and say, Pastor Terry, I really believe that God has called me to be a counselor and to step into people's lives and become a counselor. And I said, well, this is how you do that. And I gave them the plan and I told them my dreams. And they're like, I'm going to do that. And I remember walking back up to this individual and I was thinking about this this morning as I was preparing this message. And I thought, I walked up to him and I said, so when are you going to do that? And they're like, well, I just don't have the time right now and I don't feel it's the right season in my life. And can I tell you, when, when is the right season in your life to start working for God when he talks to you? All right? Now, listen, that doesn't mean the door necessarily opens up like and instantly opens up. Maybe this morning God's laying on your heart. I don't know. Maybe you're sitting here and you saw Shannon on the guitar and her playing two guitars. You're like, man, I really feel like I should learn to play the electric guitar. Well, it's not time to walk up to Maria and say, can I be on the worship team and play the electric guitar? Because you don't know how. How many know what I'm talking about? And if you got up there, it would be a really bad electric guitar. Shannon does much better than you. But how many know that if you get into it and you learn how and you spend the time and you, you put in the ability, there comes a season in my life where I am doing what God's telling me to do because I need to learn how to do what God's doing or I need to prepare myself for what God is calling me for. Has everyone got that? The preparation time is not the fun time. How many know that, Right? Like you decide to play football, and how many know that if you play football or basketball or track or wrestling or anything, the first thing you've got to do is go to preconditioning, right? And you've got to sit there. And it's not fun. They don't give you a football. They don't put the pads on. They don't put all the equipment on. They sit there and say, we're going to hit the weights. Okay, we're going to go run the hills. We're going to do suicides. They still do suicides, or is that too hard now? Okay, good. I'm glad they still do suicides. But, you know, you go out there and you run, and sometimes you run so much to what happens when you run like that. Has anyone ever done football, done that? Sometimes you find out what's inside of you. Yes, and the coach finds out what's inside of you, and sometimes it smells really bad. But they're also finding something else that's inside of you. They're finding out the character that's inside of you and whether or not you have the ability and the want to to succeed. You see, America has dumbed it down where we want to succeed without any price. Come on now. America's dumbed it down where we're like, well, these are my rights. No, rights are not given, they're earned. How many know, I do not have the right to drive a car. I have the privilege of driving a car. Does everyone understand? It's like we think, I hear some people are like, I have the right to a living wage. No, I just want to educate everyone. Can you listen to me one second? Minimum wage was never meant to live off of. Minimum wage was an introductory job for high school people, for people just entering the workplace to get a skill set to learn how to do and learn how to work. You do not get paid $30,000 a year to flip a burger. Well, you can, but your burger is then going to cost you $27.50. All right? That's just how that works. You see, minimum wage is to make you uncomfortable that you sit there in this job and you're washing dishes and you're like, 
There's got to be something better than this to do with my life. How many know what I'm talking about? And you say, boy, I need an education. Boy, I need to get trained. Boy, I need to learn a skill. And it's called an incentive. God works in that way. God is clearly seen in all of creation. You know that? You can see him in our, in our society where God sits there and says, I'm not going to honor you. Some of you are like, man, I just want to be a preacher. I want to be super popular. He can't trust you yet because he doesn't know what happens. I hear this a lot. Power corrupts people. You've heard that, right? Well, they got this permission, they're this position, and now they're corrupted. No, power does not corrupt. If power corrupted someone, God would be the most corrupt creature in the universe. He is by no means the most corrupt person in the universe or creature. He is the most holy, upright, honest, good, faithful, all those words I can put there. That is God. You see, power does not corrupt me. Power reveals me. Are you with me this morning? So as we go through this getting the promised land, as we talked about last week, and if you were here and you know the story about Joshua, they didn't just jump into the promised land and everyone bow down and all the things happened. Matter of fact, God said something to them, and I think a lot of times we don't understand this, but he said, little by little I will drive them out. Because if I drive them out all at once, the beast would become so enormous that they would devour you from the land. So I got to realize with this walk with God, it's not like everything just falls in place and everything happens, but it's a little by little. It's a process. How many know processes teach me patience? How many in here like patience? Praise. How many wish you had more patience? Well, praise God. You're in a great place because God will teach you more patience. You know, sometimes you're like, and we live in a society now where we want it now, right? That's why we all carry credit cards, debit cards, whatever. And, you know, we've got Amazon where we can order. And, you know, we had COVID-19 going on and we're like, really? Seven days from Amazon? Did anyone else say that besides me? Because I was spoiled with one day or two days. And I'm like, seriously? I can't get this for, what, 15 days, 30 days? And they would surprise me to come early. You always set the bar further out and it comes quicker and the people are happy, right? That's how you work that out. But if I tell you you can have it tomorrow and it doesn't come the next week, you're mad at me, right? That, so God works that same way in all of our lives. So we've got to realize this is a process getting in my promised land. And I have to learn in this promised land. So we have this man, Joshua, who last week was on one side. They crossed to the other side, right? They circumcised their hearts. Well, they circumcised their flesh. We circumcise our hearts, the word of God says in 1 Corinthians. And after that, he walked out and he met a man who was Jesus, right? And he said, are you for me or against you? Remember his words because they're important. He said, neither. I'm not for you and I'm not against you. I am here to fulfill God's plan. Has everyone got that? You see, that's why so many of us in this world don't get fulfilled because God has a plan for our lives, but we don't want it. So then we don't follow God's plan and we end up in this, how many ever had a hamster? How many had a gerbil? How many remember when they had a hamster or a gerbil wheel? And how many know that they sit there and they get on this little wheel and they go, and how many know they get off the same place they got on, right? They're like thinking, man, I'm really, treadmill. How many ever ran a treadmill? It's like, I ran five miles. No, you didn't go anywhere. I just want to tell you that right now. You did not go. Your legs might have moved for the equivalent of five miles, but you stayed in the exact same spot. The belt moved five miles, but you stayed in the same spot. How many get that? Yeah. How many want to live life that way? I don't want to live life on a hamster wheel. I don't want to live life on a treadmill. People are like, oh, I like working out inside. I want to be outside. I want to move through that. I want to live in that. So God's speaking to our hearts in this process of going into our promised land. And what I'm trying to get you to understand is I don't just get there on one day and go, wow, everything happened. It may seem like at times that God lines up all the things and you're there and you're like, wow. But it's been a process in your life where God has been changing you, transforming you, molding you, making you right? You're on the job site, right? And you've been faithfully gone to work. You've been there for six years. And all of a sudden, the owner of the company walks up to you and says, I want to make you supervisor. It didn't just happen on that day, did it? No. He's watched you. He saw your work ethic. He saw how you interacted with other people. He did all those kind of things, and he promoted you, right? And now you're in this position. How do you get the job? You didn't just get the job by applying there. Matter of fact, one of the worst things you can do as a business owner, and I've been one, is hire someone to be management who's never worked in your company because they don't understand your vision, your dream. And if you ever worked for a bigger company and they brought someone in from the outside, you know what that's like. 
because they don't understand the business. They don't understand the purpose, and they understand maybe numbers or they understand something else, but they don't understand how to run things. Everyone got that? So God is not going to walk up to you this morning and say, oh, so you, you, you want to follow me now? Okay, I'm going to make you one of my top disciples. He's not going to do that. He's going to train you. Does everyone understand that? It starts by me, what? Crossing the Jordan River in the power of the Holy Spirit, a supernatural move of God where I move to the other side, it closes up, and I never want to go back to the world. Everyone got that? That was last week. Good. All right, so this week... We're going to do something. We're taking the promised land in the power of the Spirit or the Holy Spirit. Now, some people wig out whenever you talk about Holy Spirit. They're like, oh, you know, like ghosts. The King James Version calls them the Holy Ghost. I'm not sure why you want to have a Holy Ghost in your life. I'd rather have a Holy Spirit in my life than a ghost. Ghosts haunt you. Spirits drive you, right? Yeah. So get that. But anyhow, he sits there and he says, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. He says some things about him. We've covered this. He will lead you. He will guide you into what? All truth. The only thing he will do, the Bible says, you shall know the truth and the truth will what? Set you free. You see, I need to program my mind to always speak truth. And it will set me free in every area of my life when I speak the truth. So it goes on. So, and I want to teach you on what to expect because this has been a journey in my life. It's been a process to get where I am. It's been a process to see God change me. It's been a process to see God bless me. It's been a process to build things. Like, we're all excited. I'm all excited because we're going to be open a fun center. And we are passing out brochures for it for the first time at the fireworks explosion in October of 2020. We're going to open this place up as a fun center. That's cool, right? But you know how many years it took of labor to do it? You know how much work it took? It took an incredible amount of work to get everything put in place. Now, a lot of people walk in and go, wow, this is really cool, but they don't understand the work of it. You see, that's the people that are going to follow you into the promised land that they're going to be like, wow, this is an awesome place, but they weren't there cutting the trees down. I smile sometimes. I go into Lancaster and even places around here, and you'll see a farm that someone made, and you'll see them go in and turn it into a housing development. And I sit there and I think about it, and I think, man, the farmer who cleared this land would roll over in his grave. Because you have no clue the amount of effort he put into the fields to turn them into the, the topsoil that's there and all the stuff that's there. I was watching down on River Road. They're putting in a new Dollar General in case you want to know what it is. We're getting a new Dollar General in North Apollo. We need another one of those, don't we? I'm just thinking, I was hoping it was something like at least Wendy's or McDonald's or something that Apollo was going to move into like the 21st century and have a drive through restaurant, but not at all. It's another Dollar General. But I was watching it as they cleared it off. Does everyone know where I mean? How many have driven past that work site? Have you seen the piles and piles of topsoil? Do you know how many years that topsoil took? One time that area was farmland. How do I know? Because they got like a pile that's probably like almost as high as that truss up there, that lighting truss that is sitting there of what? Brown, dark brown, rich topsoil. Man, that would, you need topsoil. That is some quality dirt, I'm telling you. And I was looking at that and I thought, they have no clue how much cow manure went on there, how many crops went in there, how much stuff they, because topsoil doesn't develop very quickly. If you go into the woods and you think there's a lot of topsoil there from the leaves decaying, you'll find out there's only about that much topsoil on the trees, under the trees and what stuff's growing in. It is time, it's patience, it's people harvesting, it's people plowing stuff back in, it's about people pulling rocks out, it's about people pulling weeds out, it's about all that process to make that land fertile, right? Well, here's the cool part. God takes you and I into a fertile land that he's prepared for us. We become the farmers, we become the people. Our lives when we walk with God, listen very closely once you get this, either they will become extremely fruitful or they will become extremely weedy. Weed-y, W-E-E-D-Y. Is that right, Bethany, weedy? Is that like weedies? W-E-H-E-A-T-I-E-S, weedies. All right, it will. I, the farmland that is around here, there's a lot of farms around here that you can hardly tell they're farms anymore. How many know the quality of the soil is still there, but what's growing on top isn't producing any fruit, right? You see, that's some Christians' lives. They walk into the promised land and they're like, this ain't any good land. Well, what you let grow is what's going to grow, and can I tell you something? It grows really well there. You know that? If you take a farmland 
that was farming, you just let it go. The weeds thrive. Why? Because there's fertilizer, there's nutrition, and man, they thrive. But if you keep after the weeds, you'll get a tremendous amount of fruit, right? So you got to understand that in your life. You have the ability to walk into God's promised land and be plentiful, or you have the ability to walk into God's promised land and sit there and say, God lied, I don't get anything out of this. I've met people like that. Well, I'm not getting anything about following Jesus. I tried following Jesus, nothing happened in my life. That's because you didn't plant the right things and you didn't keep the garden weeded and you didn't take care of the promised land that God gave you. All right? Now, someone's thinking, what if I messed it up? Well, it's really easy. You go buy a weed eater and you start knocking them all down. You go buy a tractor, you start pulling out all the garbage. And by the way, everyone listen, it's a process. All right. Even if God comes by and sprays weed killer on everything and it all dies and you have the fertile soil, how many know the roots are still there, the trees are still there, the stuff's still there, and the things that I let go, and if anyone dumped rocks in my land, they're still there because I wasn't watching the land, right? So no matter what, it's going to take you work. I don't know why we expect like God, we just ask God and God just goes like, boom, poof, and you go like, yeah, boy, my check account's empty. God, what should I do? Pfft. Oh, wow, I got more. I'll spend it the same way I used to spend it. No, the reason your checking account's probably empty is one of two things. Either you haven't pursued a good enough education to get a gooder, better, gooder job. You want a gooder job, right? Or you didn't be faithful with it. You know, I know some people that went and applied to companies and they had a really good company job, but they didn't treat it well and they didn't show up in time. Right, Todd? And all that kind of good stuff. And then they can't get hired back there. And that kind of stuff bites you in the butt, doesn't it, Todd? You know, sometimes a little bit. That happens. Why? Because they look at our work ethic and they said, I tried you before. And how many know in your job application, I wish it was there, but it doesn't say, has God changed your life? Because if you check that box, you'd get, maybe get another chance. But how many know the world doesn't like that box? Okay, everyone there. So I'm in the promised land. I'm walking in the promised land. So what do I expect? Led by the Spirit, right? And I like this. Discerning the leading of the Holy Spirit. We're going to be talking about this a lot. Uh, Because I want you to learn how, because no one taught me how. They're like, you need to get filled with the Holy Spirit. And they're like, oh, you got the Holy Spirit. Not what I do. (laughs) You got the Holy Spirit. What do I do? You got the Holy Spirit. He'll tell you. Well, it didn't work very good for me. It's a whole lot better if someone else teaches you, right? So I'm going to do my best to teach you what I've learned through years of walking with God, through years of following God, through years of making mistakes, through years of opening wrong doors and walking through wrong doors, through years of making bad decisions that have hindered my life and maybe hindered your life, maybe you relate to what I'm talking about. If you don't walk with God, and by the way, no matter who we are in flesh and blood, when we walk in the Spirit, you will make mistakes. I just want to tell you that right up front. Nobody's going to walk perfectly with God in this flesh. It's just our flesh, unfortunately, is our flesh, and it gets in our way. Everyone got that? Be okay with that, seriously. Because you serve a miracle-working God that is going to overcome those areas in your life because he looks upon my heart. Aren't you glad? You know, I look at David, and God said he was a man after God's own heart. And I sit there and say he was a murderer. Everyone's like, he murdered a man. No, he didn't murder a man. He murdered lots of men. You see, Uriah was a guy who was the head of special forces of an army, and he says, put Uriah there, and if Uriah was there, who else was there? All of his army, and who died? All of them died. So David just didn't put one man to death, he put a lot of men to death. Everyone got that? He committed adultery, right? He blew it. He counted people when he shouldn't have. He blew it. But you know what God said about him? He was a man after my own heart. You see, God looks on the Inside, man looks on the outside. And that's the great part about God. Because all of you here have a reputation. I don't know about you, but if somebody put up there and says, this is your life, Terry Jones, I think I'd leave if God did that. I think we all would, right? Because we'd be like, okay, that part I don't want anyone to see. Uh, Unless it said, this is your life, Terry, edited by God. (laughs) I'd be like, okay, this is going to be a good one. It'll be okay. But if it was just a history of my life, there's certain sections of my life that I'm sure you have that you would like to just kind of fast forward, right? Right? YouTube, fast finger it, you know, just slide it forward a little bit. Don't want this part. Skip this ad. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Well, we can't do that. So here we go. We're going with God, and I want to ask you the question again, what am I doing for God at this time? That is what God's asking all of us. Remember, it comes down to I am either building God's kingdom or I am building my kingdom. 
I can't build both. Well, I can, but how many know neither one ends up well? So we've got to make up our mind. One of the things we've got to decide, all of us in our lives, am I going to live and build my life or am I going to build God's life? Yep, and that's the decision we have to make. Now, from that, we will bear fruit. Both of them will bear fruit. I don't want to get too much in that. and don't want to get too deep because I want to go somewhere. So now Joshua has crossed the river, and the very first place that faces Joshua is a city called Jericho. I hope you can see it. I hope you can see there's two walls, and this is from an archaeological dig where they have found Jericho, the city, and they pretty much now know us. They know that there was two walls. There was an outside wall. The lower wall, the, the lower houses, was where the prostitute lived. That's where the lower people lived. The upper wall was what? Where the richer people lived, the better off people lived. So there was two walls. So basically, the people on the bottom had a wall, but they're the sacrificial people that it can turn into a battle zone, you're okay. Around it, it has something else. There's also a ditch there, all right? So speaking of this, it's built on a mound, so to attack this place is going to be very, very hard. Has everyone got that? It's one of those places that God puts right in front of him, and God says, listen, man can't get in this city. This is a city that is defended and built wisely. It's a city that is built smartly. It's a city that was built the way it should have been built, and it's defended. So God comes to Joshua, and we find that in Joshua chapter 5, verse number 1, where God shows up to Joshua, not shows up, but talks to Joshua, and it says this, now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in, COVID-19. Everyone got that. No one's going out, no one's coming in. They are walled up. They are like, no way. They have supplies in there because one of the ways you defeated a city was to besiege it. And when you put it under a siege, you would sit there, but they had food in there. They had water in there so they could outlast the people who were trying to attack them and trying to get them. That was part of the battle that they had. So they're literally sitting there, and God, isn't it amazing that God puts the biggest, hardest city right there in front of them right to start off the bat? Your life sometimes will be like, now not everyone's going to have that. Just want to let you know, not everyone's going to have that thing. But I think all of us, when we really sell out to God, we're going to find this place of our life that we can't defeat, that we can't overcome. Would someone at least give me a Presbyterian nod? Even if it's a sleep nod, it's okay. Just give me the nod. All right, so we sit there and we're going through that. And I come to this place in my life, and I've had to do it where I came many times, but I've come to these places in my life that, you know, you've attacked them, you've tried to defeat them, you tried to overcome them, but it's like every time you try, you fail. Has anyone else done that besides me? Yeah, it's pretty not very fun. And you're like, I'm going to overcome it this time. And you get beat back until it becomes like an area of your life that you just ignore. You like hang a picture over it, right? You got this water leak in your house, you've tried to fix it, it leaves a stain in the wall all the time, so you just say, I'll hang a picture over it. No, I see the picture, I never see the stain. Don't lift up the picture, please, because if you look under there, there's mold growing, black mold is now infecting my house and all that kind of stuff, but the picture covers it all, right? Well, that's that area of our life. So we come to this Jericho that we've got to fight through and we've got to battle through. So God sits there and he says something. You've got to remember the important part of this, right? This is the promise, God's promise. God promised them, I will give you the promise promised land, right? So when I get in this spot, I'm going to have to stand there in my spiritual man and say, wait a minute, I'm doing what God wants me to do now, and I'm in my promised land, so God is going to help me. And you need to tell yourself that. I'm going to win this thing. I don't know how, but I'm going to win this thing. I've got a God and a Father that's bigger than anything in this world. I'm going to win this thing. So he goes on, and he begins to talk a little bit more. And I want you to remember what Jesus said about some keys. There's lots of keys there, right? And I hope you remember this scripture, but this is what it says, Matthew 16, 19. It says, I will give you the keys of the heaven's kingdom realm to forbid on earth that which is to be forbidden in heaven and to release on earth that which is to be released in heaven. That's the passion translation. So God says something. I'm going to give you a key. Now, how many know when I give you the key, I don't open the door for you? Has everyone got that? Some people get stuck there. If I give you the key to my truck right now, that does not mean the truck is running and it is unlocked and everything is there. You have to do what? I give you the key here. It's on the other side of the parking lot. What do you have to do? You have to walk there. You've got to know how to use the key. 
right? I got a funky key. Mine's not a normal key. It doesn't have the key like that. It's just a little bobby thing. They just push and it does things. You know, it's magic. And you stick it in the hole and it just starts it. And it's really kind of cool. But it's a key. Everyone know it's a key? But that doesn't mean the truck's running and the doors are unlocked and everything's okay. Has everyone got that? So when God gives me the key, he's giving me the ability. He's giving me the pass. He's giving me the peace I need to open what? What I need opened. Now, if I keep the key in my pocket, I can get mad at God. And some people do this. I'm mad at God. He said he'd give me the keys. Well, he gave you the key. Now, listen, a lot of the keys are in the word of God. They're scriptures that I need for this moment. So if I don't go where the keys are, I can't get the doors open. Everyone follow that? You were like little kids. I'm going to do it. I'm in the door. I'm going to God's like it's open. No, it's not. Look, it's locked. But we well, have the key. No, I don't. Well, whose fault was that? Remember, this is the responsibility part, right? Minimum wage, job, responsibility. And everyone wants to make what a CEO makes, but nobody wants to take the responsibility that a CEO has, right? How many know what I'm talking about? You didn't care this morning if the sound guy was off. You wanted to hear the singer sing, right? Come on now. So what? My responsibility was to make the sound. You didn't care. How many wanted it to be cool in here this morning? Did you want to walk in here this morning and me say, oh, yeah, I'll turn the air conditioning on for you. It's 97 degrees in here. How many know that won't do much right now? So what I do, I turned the air conditioning on last night. Actually, I turned it on yesterday morning so that the building would cool off and everything would be good. So when you walked in here, you'd have a good experience. You see, that's part of the keys. I've got to know how to do that. And that's the responsibility part that God gives all of us in our lives for our ministry, our promised land, our call of our life, where I have to be responsible and ready for this. It's a big word. Ready? You sure? How many ready for this? What is it? What's the word? Think. Yeah, you got to think. Not feel, think. You see, I don't feel like always coming in here and turning all the TVs on for you and putting all the PA system on. When my alarm clock went off at 5.30 this morning, I didn't feel like going for my prayer walk. I didn't feel like that. I got up, I was still a little sore from the you know, the rototiller experience, and I was kind of tired and all that kind of stuff, and I could have just laid in my comfy bed, but I thought about it, and I said, I have to get up because what we've got to do is we've got to, you ready for this again? It's a big, powerful word, think. If there's one thing Americans don't want to do today, it's think. We want to talk about how we feel, we want to whine to somebody, we want to text somebody, we want to share our emotions, we want to tweet on Twitter, we want to talk about on Facebook, we want to do all that kind of stuff, but we don't want to think. And because when we start thinking, it means we got to work, right? I get around people and they're like, I think I'm hungry for sheets. And I say, drive to sheets. Well, I don't know if I want to. Oh, so you want something, but you don't want to think through the process of getting to there. Come on now. You see, that's a process all of us have to go through. It's a thinking process. Whether you like it or not, I can stand here and go, wait. I'm going to, got the key for my truck. I'm going to mental telepathize myself to my truck. Can I tell you something? I will still be standing here tomorrow. Why? Because it doesn't work. How many know that doesn't work? How many ever were tried the easy way out? How many ever tried to Band-Aid fix something? How many know Band-Aid fixing totally does not work? How many realize that maintenance, maintaining something and working on it constantly and replacing the parts and doing the things right always gets you further in the long run? How many ever stuck a Band-Aid on your car only to drive down the road to find out your Band-Aid fell off? And you're now sitting on the side of the road and it's 95 degrees and your family is mad. How many know what I'm talking about there? They're like, how many ever thought, you didn't think, but you thought? How many know a thought is different than a think? Right? Everyone get that? You know, you look at your gas gauge and you thought you could make it to the next one. How many ever have given that a thought try? How many ever ended up sitting on the side of the road calling for someone with a gas can? 
And you're hoping at that moment you remember the triple A paper that is sitting on your table that you meant to join triple A. And you call them and say, can I join now? And they say, nope, sucks to be you. Right? And you're sitting there going, ah, if only. You see, there's a difference between a thought and a think. I want you to get that. Because a thought is I'm thought about it, but thinking is I think it through. Everyone got that? It's a process of thinking it through. It's a process I think about how I'm going to get there. And I'm willing sometimes to let other people put input into my life so I can get there because some people really are smarter than me. Not many, but some. Just kidding. How many ever have that opinion? I can do it. How many ever of your kids sit there and say, Mom, I want this. Okay, let me open it for you. No, I can get it. And they get all mad. Why not? Here, open this. We've all experienced that, right? You see, that was a thought. That wasn't thinking through how I'm going to get it open. I just saw you do it, so I just think I can do the same thing. And I give it a little thought, but I don't think the process through, right? You all getting this? This is called responsibility in the promised land. You see, we all just thought that when we started serving God, not we, but a lot of people think when they just started serving God, God's just going to line up all the ducks in a row. He's going to give me all the ammunition to shoot all the ducks. It's just going to be moving from glory to glory. There's not going to be any dry places. There's not going to be any of that. You know, right now, for the last five years, you could have probably dug a two-foot hole in the ground and had a well because we had so much water, right? Well, here we are in 2020, and guess what? It's 90-some degrees. I told my wife the grass turns brown here. And she looked at me last year and she says, I've lived here for five years and I've never seen brown grass. I said, honestly, I remember it crunching under my feet as a kid, right? Now, most of the time, we have a lot of water here, right? It rains a lot. I can remember 4th of July is when it was 40 degrees and raining, no lie, in the mountains of, of Wimber and sitting there and trying to see the the fireworks on the next mountain over in the fog, and it just doesn't work very well. I mean, it gets cold and it gets rainy. But this year, how many know that if you dug a two-foot well, according to the past experiences, you are severely in a world of hurt and you're thirsty right now. And you wish you could flush your toilet. But you can't. Why? Because i got to prepare. So I've got to think this through and say, well, what's it look like, right? All right, so everyone's getting that. So I get the keys. So as we move on, it says in Joshua chapter 6, verse number 1, I'm going to try to move through this because I want to get through this next week and i got 20 minutes. It says, then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. Everyone got that. What did he do? So he gave him what? He gave him the key. I have delivered it into your hands. Right? Now, all through the Word of God, I read in the Word of God where Jesus Christ has delivered stuff into my hands and the Father has blessed me with things in the Word of God. But that does not mean, Marvin, that I just stand there waiting for it to come. That does not mean that I stand there and just saying, okay, God, when's it going to show up? When's it going to come in my life? That does not mean that. What that means is I've delivered into your hands that you have the power, the authority, and you are given the right to overcoming Jericho. Right? Now, I've got the key for it, but what do I got to do? I've got to do it now. How? God's way. How many ever, someone gave you a key to it, but it's a stubborn key. You got to put it in a certain way and put it in a certain pattern and all that kind of good stuff. And it's a key, right? But you're like, this don't fit. And they're like, sure, it does. You have to do this. See, like that. Sometimes this lock's a little bit sticky and you got to do that. Well, well, you didn't tell me that. You just said, don't open it with a key. Well, I gave you the key. You just got to know the process. So here he is. I've given you this. He says, along with the king and his fighting men. Now he says something. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. So he tells them how to do it. I got seven priests in the front. I got trumpets in the front. I got the, 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 the ark of the covenant behind. And I've got the people behind. We're marching around Jericho. How many times? Six days I do one lap. Okay, everyone get this. God is coaching them. Does everyone understand that? One of the things God's teaching them, and he's going to teach you this right now, is obedience. You have to do it my way. Now, I don't know you, but I know me. If God would have said this, I would have said, like, you know, God, instead of doing this every day, it's six, six to one time for six days. Why don't we? Just think about this thing. Can't we just do like six laps one day and just sit in our lawn chairs for the next five and just, you know, play in the water? Does anyone else think this way besides me? 
I think this way when it comes to God sometimes. But God says, this is how I want you to do it. Now, how many know that if he would have did five times, took a day off, and then followed the rest of it, it wouldn't have worked? Does everyone get this? You see, the reason, now, I'm going to let you in on a clue here. The walls are going to fall, okay? Israel's going to take the city. I want everyone to get that. But there's a reason why. Because they're following God's pattern. If they would have not followed God's pattern, it would have said, and the children of Israel walked around the city, did it this way. They blew the trumpet and the people laughed at them. But God has a man there that he trusts that he knows he will obey him because he obeyed him 40 years earlier. You got that? You see, 40 years ago, this same man was sent into a land, and he said we could overcome the land, but everyone else said, no, we can't overcome the land. Him and Caleb were the only ones who believed God and trusted God, and all the rest doubted God, and he had to wander around in the wilderness for 40 stinking years. How many are glad God's not making you wander around the wilderness for 40 years? All right, give him a thank you right there. Just let him know that because he's a God of mercy. But so anyhow, this is what he says to do. He says, after that. So Joshua, he goes on the next thing in Joshua. He says this. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. Now, I don't know about you. Seven laps with priests blowing, they're tired priests. Did everyone get this? So for seven laps, how many of you know that was a big city? You're hearing, Boo! How many know that'd get a little annoying? I get annoyed when it says, Boop. this is a test of the emergency broadcast system. Had this been an actual emergency? We wouldn't told you where to tune at the proper time. Like, get out of my way. I know what it is. But for seven laps, they're walking around. Marvin, you sat in the wrong seat. Marvin blowing a trumpet. Now, does that make any sense? How many sit there and says, oh, that would make a city fall? How will make all the people run out of the city? That'll, that absolutely, God, you got, I, that makes perfect sense to me. All right, you got to get this fact. You ready for this fact? Walking with God will not make sense to you because he's God, you're not. Everyone got that. So what God says to do, you're like, well, if I do that, that just doesn't make any sense. And God's like, yeah, I know. That's why I told you to do it because you want to try to figure out everything your way. And as long as you keep trying to figure it out your way, you're going to keep messing it up and nothing's going to happen. You're going to be like, God lied. And you're going to be like, I quit. I'm not walking with God anymore because it didn't work. You screwed up. You didn't do it in the right sequence. You didn't do what God said to do. God told you to do it in the right manner. How many ever tried to bake a cake besides me and didn't follow directions? What do Christians do for fun? I remember one day I thought I'd make the uh, cake and I was like, why do I have to do this in this order? Why don't I just put them all together at once? I had mud. And it didn't taste well. And it didn't bake well. How many ever thought maybe you'd deviate and try something new with the recipe that somebody gave you? And you thought, I know, I'll add a little more spice, a little more of this. And you put it in your mouth and went, oh my goodness, this is bad. Is that how it turned out, Maria? I uh, figured that. Nick's like, yep, that's how I did it. Yeah, how many know if you don't follow the directions, you don't get the right product? How many ever bought one of those big entertainment centers back in the day? And you went to Walmart and you picked it out and you saw the picture in the front and you're like, that's cool. And you brought it home and you tried to put it together because you don't need instructions. And then you start putting it together and you're like, it doesn't fit. And then you read directions and it says, whatever you do. Do not put part M in place. And you look over and go. How many have ever done that besides me? If you're a guy, you probably do this kind of stuff. Just let you know. How many before GPS? Maybe you, you're old enough to remember this. But you'd say, why don't you ask for directions? No, I know where I'm going. How many know what I'm thought? Yeah. Now I look at my wife. I'm like, get that on the phone now because I have no clue where I'm at. Bless God. And five minutes later, I still don't know where I'm at because she's still looking to try to get her phone to work, but it's all cool. <laughs> Gotta love modern technology. All right, when you hear the sound of the long blast and the trumpets, have all the people give a loud shout. So we got a trumpet going on, we got a loud blast going on, we got the seventh time, they all are supposed to shout. And he says this, he says, give a loud shout, then the wall of the city will collapse and the people will go up every man straight in. Now, 
it wasn't something like amazing. It was whenever they followed God's directions. I want everyone to get this. When they followed God's directions and did what God said, God honored them and he said, fall down. And the walls went flat. Isn't that cool? Except one spot. Where was that? That was where Rahab, the prostitute, the harlot was. Because God gave her a promise that she should go in her house and because she trusted God, it wouldn't happen. And even Joshua said, make sure you go get in Rahab because she has a promise in life. So God honored his own people except he had another promise written in and said, I also promised her something. So that part of the wall is not, so be prepared for that, just to let you know. So sometimes in your life, you're going to see God's wanting to do things. And he's going to give you a promise, but he's going to leave this other part there that you don't understand is a promise to someone else that's part of your vision and part of your dream. Yeah, that's pretty cool, isn't it? And we're like, well, that's not the way you said it happened. And God's like, it's exactly the way I wanted it to happen because I have a purpose for her. And I don't want to get in that purpose, all right? So I got to move on because we're going to get this. So the keys to success. You ready for this? Number one, <clears throat> he heard the voice of God. Now, you got to listen to the voice of God, all right? So once you get that, Joshua 6, in the next verse, he goes on. Come on, give me my next verse. It says, so Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, take up the ark. How many know none of this has happened yet? I'm telling you the end result, but none of this has happened yet. But now Joshua is getting the guys together, take up the ark, the covenant of the Lord, and have the seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he goes on and he says, so back to the keys of success. Number two, Right? He used his position for God. Has everyone got that? So this is part of the walk with God. Number one, I hear from God. I hear and God will tell me what I need to do according to my position. Has everyone got that? We don't like this part. Lots of people are like, I had a guy help me build houses one day. I hired him. We were building a house for somebody. And this guy came on and he's like, he was sitting there telling everyone how that he should be making more money and how that he was going to go work here and there. And my wife was working with me. I looked over and I said, he can't even show up to work on time. How many know if you don't show up to work on time, you don't make much money? How many, if you take off the days that you want to take off, you don't make much money? How many know this, that every time you get a sniffles, if you stay home, you don't make much money? I'm just telling you facts of life. This is called work ethic that employers look for and companies look for. They do not reward you just because you show up. Just want to let you know that. All right? So he had to do something. He took his position and he said something. You priests are going to do this. All right? So moving on to the next thing he did. He did this. So we're walking in spirit now. Ready? I got to walk at this side because my screen's over here for all you people online. I keep looking on that side. It's this side. Okay? He ordered the people advance. What did he do? He ordered them. He used his position for God and said, this is what I want you to do. We are going to do this. this is, how many know the fireworks explosion was really cool? How many have started out with an idea? How many know that idea was given to leaders? Leaders started building teams. Teams started recruiting people. People started buying things. Things started coming together. All the things happened. And it wasn't just like we pulled in here on Friday night and said, we're going to have a fireworks explosion. There was people setting up bounce houses. People setting up foam machines. People setting up this. People doing this. People going here. People going there. And there was no one person that did it all, but everyone did it together, right? That's called a team. That's called the church. That's called the body of believers. That's why we're part of a church, because in order for us to do outreach, we need lots of people. Right? Good. I'm glad you got that. All right, he goes on and he says, march around the city with the armed guard going ahead of the ark. And he goes on and he says a little bit more. So the next thing he does, this is what he does. He followed the voice of God. Did everyone got that? So he heard the voice of God. He used his position and then he followed the voice of God. I need to do those steps. If God is calling you for things, it's going to have to be in that process. God does not deviate from it. God gives you the key. God tells you how to do it. If you get lazy, if you get sidetracked, if you wait too long, if you do those things, these opportunities with God are only for a season. Does everyone understand that? If Joshua would have stood there and said, you know, I hear what you're saying, God, but you know, we were really planning a fishing expedition in the Jordan River. That's what we were in. We heard it flows into the Sea of Galilee, and we want to go down and play at the seashore for a while. How about, God, we come back in a month? Now, that would have been more appeasing to the fish and more appeasing to the fishermen because, you know, they're thinking about fish. They haven't had fish for a long time. How many know that? 
Matter of fact, you know, some of these people never had fish. They've been eating manna out of the, the desert. How many know fish aren't in the desert? They could have been, uh, they might have been walking through there and there might have been some fish heads looking at them and the waters that stood on edge. It might have been like, with their little flippers. And there might have been like, food. Yeah. They were thinking red lobster. Why can't we go and fish? You see, there's a season, there's that door opportunity opening for that individual. And I think back to that individual who wanted to be a youth pastor and was telling me that. Could they still become it? Yes. But how many know that opportunity now is so much further along and you realize you can get to a point of life where you miss the opportunity? Don't do that. Even if you kind of fumble your way through it and mess it up a little bit and wait, do what God tells you to do. So here he is. So he followed God's voice. He did not do something. And these are things I want you to understand. He did not question what God said. Remember, it doesn't make any sense to me that a city's all closed up and I'm doing these things. The next thing he did, he didn't ask the people what they thought. One of the places we get sidetracked as Christians walking with God is God tells us to do something. We begin to ask people what they think. Does everyone understand that? Don't ask people what they think. Because you know what? They're going to think it through for you, and they're going to sit there. And if they're close friends of yours, they might sit there and go, if you start walking with God and you start talking with God, you might be sitting there, and God might be calling you to preach. God may be calling you to teach. God might be calling you to do whatever it is. I have no clue what it is, and I'm not giving anyone a prophetic word in this moment. Just let you know that. But God might be calling you for something. If you walk up to your friends that you are now partying with and getting high with and drinking with and sleeping with, which are all wrong in God's sight, according to the Word of God, and if you're doing all those things and you ask, them and say, by the way, I think God's asking me to change your life. They're going to talk you out of it because they don't want to lose a friend. How many know that? So you got to make up your mind. you got to put on your big boy and big girl panties and you got to make up your mind that I'm going to do what God said and I'm not going to ask other people what they think about it because God has spoken to my heart. That's why I want you to learn the voice of God. And we're going to get into that. What's it sound like when God talks it to me? What's it look like? How do I understand it? How do I fix it? How do I, how do I strain it? And it's like a filter with God. It's almost like, you know, how many know if you made coffee today? And you, How many had coffee this morning with a coffee pot? How many know if you didn't put the filter and you just put the grinds in there and you just push, start, what would your coffee be like this morning? You would have been like, number one, it would have never brewed right, right? Because the little coffee grounds would have went down in your cup and when you took the first cup you'd have been like in your pot and you'd have poured it in there How, anyone ever do that by mistake it's really interesting when you do it by mistake because it's really kind of sandy I've done it I used to own a coffee shop believe it or not and I've done that already where I've forgotten I was like we're getting in a hurry and I'm like oh this is a mess and what do you do with that at that time everyone say with me it's ruined Right? And you dump it out. It's not good for anything. You can try straining it. You broke the process. It's not how it's designed. All right? So if I don't do it the right way and I don't do the things that God says in the order that God says, I make a mess of things. All right? So moving on, and we're almost done, and I hope you get this. So I got to realize, how does this apply to me? All right? You hear the Holy Spirit speaking. All of us are hearing the Holy Spirit speaking. The Holy Spirit is speaking all the time to every person in the world. I don't care how wicked they are. I don't care how lost they are. I don't care how messed they up they are. God's talking to them. Isn't that amazing? Man, I thank God that he speaks to our hearts. Why? Because no one can know Christ without the Holy Spirit speaking to you. So if you made up your mind to follow Jesus Christ, if you made up your mind to become one of his disciples, you heard the Holy Spirit calling you into the kingdom of God. That was your first touch with God. But you heard him long before that. He speaks to all of us. It's called your conscience. You remember the first time you lied and you felt guilty, the first time you cheated and you felt guilty, the first time you stole and you felt guilty, or now when you steal, you still feel guilty. That is the Holy Spirit saying, stop. He's speaking to you. All right? So I hear him speaking. We'll get into that a little bit deeper in the next messages. You use your position for God. God always gives us a position. Now, sometimes our position starts with humble things. Now, I don't know if you know that or not. You know, you look at me today and you say, well, you pastor a church, you do this. We've got a pretty cool church. We've got this cool building. Uh, 
I clean bathrooms, I swept floors, I fixed toilets, I've set toilets, I've done all those things. You know, I've played around with things. I've crawled in septic tanks. Yes, I did crawl into a septic tank because I was the smallest guy in the church. So I got to be the guy who crawled down into the pump tank whenever our septic pump failed in our sand mound back there. I've done all these kind of in January, by the way. They never fail when it's warm. They fail in January when it's freezing cold. Yeah, and I had a rope tied around me. I've done things like that. But you use your position because God has me here for this purpose. Does everyone get that? Okay, cool. So moving on. All right. So that's your work, your family, etc. So I use my position. If God blesses me with something on a job, I share it. And I use my position at work to what? Build God's kingdom. I use my position with my family to build God's kingdom. It doesn't mean everyone's going to like it. If you want to be popular, you're not going to like following the voice of God because it's not going to make you popular, but it's going to touch lives. And that's what we've got to focus our eyes on. He goes, next thing, you follow the voice of God. How many know you've got to do what God said? All of it. Remember the recipe? If I don't put it together right, what happens? I get a mess. If I don't do it at the right times, what happens? I get a mess. I am really good cooking with a microwave. I'm not very good at baking anything if it doesn't require a microwave because I don't have the patience. You know, like, set it aside and let it rise for 25 minutes. I'm like, how can I get it to rise in five? That's just me. Because who wants to stand here looking at bread rising for 25 minutes? That's just too long. And if I go do something else, I will forget about it because now I'm preoccupied with job number two. And I will come back in 65 minutes. And now it no longer looks like bread. It now looks like the creature from the Black Lagoon because it's risen up in my house. Yeah, that's what happens. So you got to follow God's voice, and that's not always fun. So I want to ask you again, what am I doing for God at this time? So that's where I want to stop. Now, here's the cool part. God is the way maker. As I get my sandals back or my flip-flops back on, the rainbow flip-flops, by the way. I like rainbow flip-flops. Here's what I got to understand. God makes the way. Where there is no way, God is going to make a way. I want everyone to get that. I want people out there to understand it. God makes a way. He specializes in impossible. You know that? So if you're sitting there and you say, well, I blew it. Now, I said some doors closed, but here's the cool thing. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. I can blow it for a long time in my life, but God still says I have a plan. And you want to hear something really amazing? I've used this scripture more times than I care to admit, but I'm going to give you one of the key scriptures I've learned in my life. That which the canker worm and the palmer worm have devoured and destroyed, I will restore unto you again. He's a God of restoration. I remember when I was about 25 years old, 26 years old, 25 years old, 24 years old, I'd been called to the ministry, I'd gone through the process, I'd gotten my minister's license, I was with, at that time, the Church of God, and I was like, God use me, and I remember I came to the front of church and I was praying on the front pew right there, and I was about right where that stuff is, right there, about second seat in, and I got down with God and I was like praying, I'm like, God, I went through all the process, when are you going to use me? If you don't use me, God, what am I going to do? The Holy Spirit spoke to me that night something that I still remember in my mind to this day, and this is what he said. Terry, I used Jesus for three years, and I accomplished more in his ministry than I did in every, any man that ever walked the face of this earth. It is not about me hurrying up. It is about me using you at the right time. And I was like, wow. So from that day on, I quit asking God to use me. And I was like, God, just let me know when the door comes open that, God, I'm ready. And that's what you need to do. Now, God makes the way. Maybe you've blown it. Maybe you've messed it up. Maybe you've never even followed Jesus. Maybe you made up your mind that, you know, you've heard about religion. And I don't blame you because I wouldn't follow religion because religion's really boring. Religion's lifeless. And that's why we do the fun things like on Friday night. You know, one person walk up to me and they're like, I want to come to your church. And that was when I said no. And they're like, but this place is fun. You guys are like real. Everyone I've met's real. And I said, well, that's awesome. And all that kind of stuff. And they're like, the church I go to, and I said, mm, I don't want to know names. It's cool. And they said it. And I'm like, well, we're just different. They're like, but they're traditional. They're this. I'm like, all I can tell you is we're weird. 
I said, we have a lot of misfits. We have a lot of people that don't fit anywhere else. And I said, a lot of us would probably be thrown out of a traditional, normal church. I said, seriously, including me. I said, we just love Jesus, and we just want to show people that, you know what, God is fun. Because I believe with all my heart, following Jesus is fun. So I said all that to say this. If you've tried religion, it's boring. It's lifeless. It's not exciting. It's not fun. And I mean that. But following Jesus and doing what he calls us for is awesome, and he's the way maker. He's going to make a way for you. And I'm going to ask the worship team to come because they're going to sing a song to you this morning. And I want to remind you of that. He's the way maker. And I don't know where you are. You see, this isn't like earth shattering stuff yet. This is called trying to teach you and get you to walk in the Holy Spirit. Because I want everyone to get this and think of this word this week. It's a process. I want you to know that. It's a process. It takes time. It's going to be a process for you to get closer and closer to God. It's going to be a process for all of us to grow. It's going to be a process for all the things to line up in my life. It's going to be a process. And, you know, anywhere in that process, I can actually really mess things up. Right? I don't know what your job is, but all of you do a job that has a process. I can guarantee it. And if you try to do it outside of that process, what happens? You make junk. It just doesn't work. I don't care if you're working at Wendy's and you're, I order a Baconator. You know, if you put the buns there and speck the burgers and the cheese on one side and the bacon the other side and you wrap it up and squirt some ketchup on it and you hand it out the window to me, I got all the ingredients of Baconator, but how many know the process didn't work? Right? I can order french fries, and if you sit there and you push the button for one minute instead of whatever minute it's supposed to be, I got wildy fries, right? They don't even stand up. They kind of go, and you bite into them, and you're like, you know, if I order french fries, you made really, really good french fries, but you're a lover of salt, and the top of the salt container falls off the lid is you're salting my french fries and you say no big deal and you just kind of shake them off a little bit and serve them to me and I drive down the road I'm going to drink all of my drink in a matter of three french fries I'm going to know what I'm talking why? because the process wasn't right you see it's that way with God I want to give you these word pictures so you understand that this is the way it works with God we've got to go through the process and we as human beings like to try to hurry God up. God, if you said if I followed you that you'd fix my marriage, well, my marriage isn't fixed yet. Well, it's a process because you know what? You were a miserable pig for a long time. And it's going to take a long time for your husband or your wife to trust that you've really changed. Everyone shake your head and go, yes. It's a process. It's going to take a while for your kids to not think that you're not going to backhand them every time they ask you a question because Jesus got in your heart and you're like, I found Jesus now and I'm different. They're, they don't believe you're different. It's a process, right? So that process is going to take time in your life. Be willing to rejoice in God and go through the process because everyone knows your job and what you do or whatever job you've had when you went through the process, how many know it worked? Well, everything God does works. And every one of you that I see here this morning, every one of you that is out there in digital land, every person that is around that will hear this message, God designed you to work. God designed you as an individual with a supernatural call in your life that will radically change this world for the positive of the Holy Spirit and the positive of an amazing God that so many lives will be changed, but you've got to be willing to go through the process you got to be willing to say, okay, God, I'm going through the process, and God, what you tell me to do, it's not going to make sense walking around cities. It's not going to make sense blowing a trumpet. It's not going to make sense doing all the things you say. But God, if you tell me to do it, God, I'm going to do it. He might tell you today when you're sitting here, he might say, I want you to go apologize to the family member you hurt. I want you to go apologize to the boss that you ripped off. I want you to go apologize and pay them back the money that you stole from them. And you're going to be like, God, I don't want to do that. But if you'll go through the process. God will radically change your life. I got a story for you, and I got to tell you this story. I know it's late, but you got to hear this. I was in an Assemblies of God church that I went to for a season, and this guy became my friend. He was an accountant. I don't like accountants, but he became my friend. And I remember one day he walked up to me. He's like, you'll never believe what God did in my life. I'm like, what's that? He says, I... I got right with God. I really got right with God. And I walked into the accounting firm. He was an accountant under the people. He worked for a firm. He said, I walked in and I told them that I had lied on tax 
returns for clients to give them better incomes and all that kind of stuff. And he said, I honestly walked in expecting to be fired. He says, you'll never guess what they did. They promoted him to the head of his department and said, if you have that much integrity that you walk in here and tell us that you did those things, you are a person we can trust because it takes a lot of guts to walk in here. You could have quit, you could have walked away and they said, all right, this is what we want you to do. We want you to go back through those and we will cover any fines, anything because of your integrity. How, how many know that's an amazing God? How many know that's a God thing when God does that? And he was like, man, he was just smiling from ear to ear. He's like, God is amazing. You see, God worked it out. He could have quit. He could have went away and said, God, you said, my dad used to make, my dad was a fantastic machinist. and He used to steal brass from the company he worked at. It's not been, gone and all that. doesn't matter. And I remember he used to make these candlesticks, these beautiful candlesticks. And he got God in his life. Jesus changed my dad. And I'll never forget, he came home one night. And he said, look, God, family, and he, my mom was sharing it with us. As my dad was there. My dad was telling the story. And he's like, I walked into my boss, and I told him that I'd been stealing brass from him, and I returned all the candlesticks. And I said, I'm sorry, and I'll pay for them. And he said, my boss looked at him and said, those are beautiful. I'll tell you what I'll do. You make me a set this big. I'll forgive the debt. I just want to set like that. I can't tell you how many candlesticks my dad made for that guy to give away to other people. And you know what? My dad became the supervisor of that department. Isn't that amazing what God does? Now listen, it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes some people look at you and say, well, you blew it, go somewhere else. But God sees your integrity. God sees that you're willing to repent. God sees that you're willing to go that extra mile. And I promise you, God will make a way where there is no way. It's a Jericho moment. Where what you think is impossible is going to fall down because he's the way maker. Would you stand with me this morning? Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. I like that. Man, I hope you're getting this. I mean that. I hope you're getting this. Because I look at people that God wants to so radically change and so radically use that it's incredible. I look at you out there, man, it's so radically crazy what God wants to do in your life. And all he wants us to do is follow that process. We're so glad you tuned in with us. We always open our doors to you. You're always welcome to come. But if not, we're glad you're there. Jesus loves you and thinks you're amazing. I want to say to all you, Jesus loves you and thinks you're amazing. He's the way maker. Now listen, I know God's talking to some of this morning. I know God's talking to your heart. Maybe your marriage is on the ropes. Maybe your family's falling apart. Maybe your job's falling apart. Maybe you've been stealing. Maybe you've been cheating. Maybe you've been lying. Maybe God's sitting there this morning talking to you saying, it's time to change the process. Trust Him. As we sing this song, Waymaker, you don't have to walk up here and say, yeah, that's me, Pastor Jerry, because I don't want to know. I don't need to know. He knows. But I want you, as I sing this song, say, God, you're the Waymaker, and I'm going to trust you. I don't know where my life's gone, but God, I am surrendering all of this because I want to inhabit this promised land. I am tired of doing it my way. I'm tired of doing it the way that everyone else told me because God, I've made a mess of things. You can even tell them I'm X years old, blah, blah, blah. God doesn't care. God says, I'm the way maker. Just trust me. I got this. Hey, Jesus loves you. Thinks you're amazing. Cry out to him. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are.
it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working never stop you never stop working never stop never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working never stop you never stop working. come on you never stop you never stop working Waymaker. Now I want to pray with you. Maybe you don't know what to say, so we're just going to pray a really simple prayer. Father, I love you. And I might have made a mess of my life, but God, I surrender it to you. I want your process. I want your ways. I want your timing. I ask your forgiveness for the times that I blew it. And God, I thank you that you're the restorer. I thank you restore what the palm worm has devoured, the canker worm has eaten. You got that idea, you're a God of restoration. And Lord, I just give you the praise that God, I give you my life. And Lord, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to do what you say. Thank you for speaking to me. Thank you for talking with me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for choosing me. I'll give you all the glory. Give me the strength to do what's right. Give me the strength to fix what's wrong. Give me the patience to follow the process. Because God, I love you. And I've tried it my way and it doesn't work. But God, I surrender it to you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great 4th of July. Declare your independence and live for Jesus Christ. God loves you. You are way maker. I worship you.